Rink Wide. It's the show that always scores, and it's season two. Wadden and J Pat here with you. We are presented by Bodog. Make a play at Canada's Choice for free casino games, sports, odds, and poker strategies. It feels good to be back, J Pat. I know you were scrum lurking today around Patrick Alvin, and we'll hear from the Canucks GM. And of course, JT Miller's extension came over the weekend. You guys did a fabulous job there on Twitter spaces with Sakaris and Price and a couple of others, Farhan Lauji as well, breaking that down over the weekend. But we are here, we are back, and we are presented by our friends at Bodog. Yeah, big thanks to Bodog, and uh, really excited about season two. So let's get after it, because uh, you're right. I had some people reaching out on social, like, where were you guys? I was looking over the long weekend. There should have been a ring quiet after the Miller announcement. Yeah. And you're right. We sort of had the crossover event with Sakaris and Price. Yeah. That all came together. Uh, great response there. And I'm sure some people uh, heard some of the things that I had to say about the GT Miller deal in the wake. I mean, we jumped on Twitter spaces right away. But we've had the weekend to digest it now. We heard from Patrick Alvin, as you mentioned. So I think, uh, you know, we can sort of give it a little bit more perspective. And that's what this episode, uh, our first episode of season two of Rink Wide, with the new logo, by the way, if you haven't yeah. seen the artwork, uh, looks pretty cool. I had nothing to do with it because my art skills are brutal. I don't know about you. Like, I, I'm a total stick figure guy. So uh, I leave it to the professionals. They did a nice job. Uh, it's out there on social. And that's uh, uh, the artwork that we're going to be going with all season long. Now, we do have a few things that we're going to announce that we're going to be uh, doing this season on Rinkwide. We'll get to that just a little bit later on here in the episode. But let's hear from JT Miller and Patrick Alvin because they did speak uh, with the media today. One of the things that I want to start with here is JT Miller in terms of his contract and just talking about how it's no longer a distraction. Here's what Miller had to say. And I know there's a lot of talks of me you know, potentially shutting off talks when I got there, but, you know, nothing was finalized from that standpoint, but, you know, I think it might free me up to play, you know, even a more consistent level of hockey and um, to know that, uh, you know, there's a commitment there. So I'm really excited to be obviously spending, a, you know, this chapter of my, uh, my life and my hockey career in Vancouver and, uh, you know, to get it out of the way before camp just so I can focus and be clear minded and uh, have a clear head is uh, exciting. That's about as honest of an answer as you're going to get from, from a professional a uh, hockey player. I, I like the fact that he acknowledged that it'll just free me up to play more consistently and not have it way way on my mind. And and again, like I said, honesty is was was there with JT Miller. And you know, we we talk about these players and oh, you know, the, you know they got the contract. And, and the thing is, is that he brought it to a human perspective at that point, though. You know, right? Like it would have weighed over his head. It would have been a massive deal if they had have went into training camp with JT Miller and no extension, and perhaps what his future held in Vancouver. So I like that answer there from JT Miller. Sure. But in the same breath, and I know we'll get to Bo Horvat uh, and what it all means for him, mm -hmm. but essentially, okay, so Miller's got his deal. He's got peace of mind. Now it just offloads that whole discussion onto the captain, right? Because he's in the same boat. He's looking for a deal. But do, and... you, do you think it's different though, because of the fact that we had all had JT Miller traded at this point, like everybody knows that there's always been an extension talk with Horvat. So I think that's the difference. It's different because of the noise that has been around JT Miller for a while with all the trade speculation. You're yeah. right. But I, again, I, I do think that it sort of moves some of that, you know, and, and Patrick Alvin was asked about Bo and said that they're talking, but that he had nothing to announce, but things can change. And he pointed to the Miller, you know, the speed with which the Miller contract got done at the end, because it looked for a long while there through the month of August, like the two sides really weren't talking and there wasn't a whole lot uh, in the way of developments or news. And then, boom, on the Friday of the Labor Day long weekend, oh, yeah, JT Miller has 56 million bucks in his back pocket. And the Canucks have, you know, the guy that Bruce Boudreau keeps referring to as his number one center. So yeah, there's been way more noise around JT Miller. But you know, just in terms of Horvat being an, piece, an important piece, the captain of this group, he too needs a contract. Now, he's under contract. And look, Johnny Hockey just went through it in Calgary. And full credit to him, he didn't let it become any kind of a distraction, put up 115 points. It can be done, right? Like, guys can play through the final year of their contract, but I'm sure Bo Horvat looks at JT Miller and says, hey, they got the Miller deal done, I'm over here, I'm in the same boat, I need a contract. And, yeah, I mean, it's look, it, it's just the way it works in a market like this one. Like, whenever Bo Horvat touches down, whenever he does his first media availability, when he does his 10th media availability, when he does his 100th media availability – if he doesn't have a contract, 
it's always going to be a question that is asked of him. You know, what's going on? What's the latest? Are sure. you worried? All those types of things. So I think in a perfect world, the Canucks would love to get a deal done for Horvat just to eliminate any of those distractions for him the same way they've done with JT Miller here. What do you think the pivot point was for the Vancouver Canucks when it came to JT Miller? Uh, Patrick Evelyn talked about the fact that they had a ton of internal discussions and they kept projecting out next year and the year after and looking at potential unrestricted free agents. And they kept coming to the same conclusion that there was nobody that they liked that they thought was going to hit the market that they felt was better than JT Miller. And so it was essentially, let's keep our own guy. Let's just make something happen here. And if Nazem Kadri was able to get seven by seven at the age of 32, then there was no chance in hell that the Canucks were going to get JT Miller on a you know a five year deal or a six year deal, a ninety nine point guy. You know Miller and his camp were able ultimately to negotiate off this one season. And uh, again, you talked about Miller and his honesty. I thought there was a ton of it. He spoke for twenty minutes via Zoom. He's back home in Pittsburgh. He said that he's coming out to Vancouver uh, this coming weekend, but his family's not going to. I mean, his wife just gave birth last week, so. Uh, the family's going to stay behind until the Canucks come off that first lengthy road trip of the season, and then the family will make their way here. Uh, but JT Miller talked about like it wasn't about squeezing every last dime out of the Canucks. It was about getting a fair deal for both sides, and ultimately that's what allowed him to put pen to paper on Friday afternoon and get this deal done. People want to bring up the fact that he's American and he chose to stay here. Do you think that maybe we're making too much of that sort of theory that people have about American hockey players? Yes and no. I go back and forth on this. Like, there's not a long track record of guys that willingly sign lengthy extensions with Canadian teams who, you know, are Americans. Like, they're just not like... I I was surprised when I saw Jeff Petrie has played more games in the NHL with Canadian teams as an American-born player than anybody else. Like, it's just not something I'd been tracking, but Jeff Petrie started in Edmonton. He's been in Montreal. Now he's, you know, he came up when he was traded, um, but there aren't a lot of guys and Johnny hockey is the latest example for whatever reason. And whether it's sort of that, you know, USA pride and believing that the, the States is the greatest place on earth. I don't tend to agree with that notion, but if you're from <laughs> there, uh, maybe, you know, like it, it is about getting back home. Um, you know, in some cases it's taxes, whatever Johnny hockey always talked about family. Like there are guys have their reasons. But it's not a long list of players that willingly choose to sign. So so I do think there is an element of truth to it. But, man, like J.T. Miller couldn't have made it a whole lot clearer that this is where he wanted to be. This is where yep. he wants to you know, raise his family, that he loves it here. He loves it. I just The number of times that he talked about how much he truly believes in this group. And I, like, he's not blowing smoke. That's not who J.T. Miller is. Like there was just a, to to hear him passionately speak about what they started under Bruce Boudreau and this belief that that's the real Vancouver Canucks and they're bringing that group back and they've added to it. In fact, like uh, he, he was genuinely excited to get this thing started. So yeah, um, you know everybody's different, but JT Miller's committed to Vancouver and what well, we all love the city. There's uh, a lot of things to like about life in Vancouver and. You know, people will say, oh, the real estate, whatever, like he's making eight mil. He'll be OK on that front. <laughs> um, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of places around the NHL that I, I don't think you'd necessarily American or Canadian that, you know, you'd want to put down roots. But Vancouver's not one of them. I mean, it's a great city and um, he's been here for a couple of years. And, you know, the other thing, too, is like really when you think of his time here, like he, he was traded at the draft in 2019, had the first six months and then COVID hit. And really since then, like, I don't think JT Miller and his family have had the opportunity to truly, you know, get the sense of exploring Vancouver uh, without masks on, without regulations and restrictions and everything else. So hopefully as a society, we're working closer to that. He's got seven years now, plus the the final year of this current deal. So, you know, I, I hope he does feel like this is home for him. Well, he talked about uh, committing to Vancouver as a whole home during his Zoom today. Well, I think what, first and foremost, the opportunity I've been given here since I've been here and how welcoming the organization and the players and the coaches have been and the management for me and my family. You know, we have good relationships with a lot of the players and wives and and I still think we have a good hockey team. I know we missed the playoffs and if you look at the grand scheme of things, you know, I thought we played a really good season at, for a certain point last year. Um, can we be better? No doubt, but 
the potential we have. And I think we're going to hit the ground running and surprise a lot of people this year. And at the end of the day, it's a business and it's work. And, you know, I want to be where we're going to have a good hockey team and we have a lot of good things to be excited about in Vancouver. And, you know, it's, you know, I'm a family guy and I like to spend time at home, but it doesn't really matter how far away that is at this point. I just want to win and I want to be at a place where we feel comfortable and we have good relationships and we kind of have all three of those there. Now the question is, what is this team though, right? Like what are they the team that we saw at the beginning of the season or are they the Bruce Boudreau team? Now we know they've improved in terms of adding some you know better players to the lineup, especially with the forward group. But the biggest thing right now is that defense. Do you believe the words of JT Miller in terms of they're going to surprise some people? Yeah, and it was interesting hearing Patrick Alvine again talking about uh, how much he believes in that defense core as well. And he said all reports are that Tucker Pullman is healthy and will be there on day one of training camp. Uh, Look, I I think from the outside, this is a savvy market. Uh, You can't pull things over on on Canuck fans. They recognize that there are concerns, particularly on the right side. But in, in saying that, I mean, and I think we touched on this on our last pod, that, you know, Jim Rutherford won Stanley Cups where people poked holes in his defense as well. He had Chris Letang True. and then, you mm-hmm. know, a cast of characters. And maybe he truly believes that uh, elite level goaltending and then just having this exceptional forward group. Now, the exceptional forward group in Pittsburgh included Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin. The Canucks don't have those players. They've got lots of good players. And then they went out and they added uh, in the summer. So, you know, I, I do think that their forward group, you know, it holds up. And if Elias Pettersson hits the ground running and plays in the well the whole season like he did the second half, then there is reason to believe that the Vancouver Canucks can take some steps forward here. And I, it was interesting, too. Miller talked about he knows he needs to be better. And then Alvin talked about how less might be more for JT Miller, that they don't want him playing 24 minutes a night, that they have they know that they've got to scale him back a little bit. And so maybe if you get him down to 21 minutes, 22, you know, it keeps him fresh over the course of the season – uh, because, again, this is a team that did lots of good things under Bruce Boudreau, but we saw playing catch-up ultimately took its toll, and that even if they had snuck into the playoffs, uh, you wonder what did they have left in the tank, right? And that's the thing is, and it, this really applies to Thatcher Demko, yeah, it's great you want Demko to play 55 or 60 games. He's got to help this team make the playoffs, but then you need him fresh and rested and ready once you get into the heat of the playoffs. And so it's not just about 82 games. I mean, to win the Stanley Cup, it's 25 more beyond that. And so uh, I'm not necessarily, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing that they're thinking of scaling JT Miller back just a touch. And maybe that's not as much penalty killing time. Or maybe there's more of an opportunity for the second unit because they've added some players, you know, so that if the power play isn't going on a particular go round, then get the second unit out there and give them an opportunity uh, whatever the case, I don't think you want or need JT Miller playing 24 minutes a night for this team. But Miller himself talked about, like, look, if we're turning pucks over, we're putting a ton of pressure on our defense and our goaltending. And so he was taking some ownership of the fact that, yeah, I mean, we've all seen it, <laughs> that there are times where you kind of roll your eyes at his defensive play. You love what he brings in the offensive zone. But, you know, he talked about wanting to be a more complete better 200 foot player and I do think that there is some truth to that that the forwards can go a long way to helping the defense core do I think that this defense core is good enough to con- no not right now to not to contend for a Stanley Cup but I, I do think that the forward group as a whole can do its part to put the defense in a in a better position on a lot of nights Miller averaged 2105 in ice time last year which led all the forwards for the Canucks. And you're absolutely right when it comes to the PK. You got a guy like Mikheyev coming in there, be able to take some of that load off of Miller's shoulders as well. Um, yeah, you talk about that defense though, and, and yeah, it's not a cup contending defense. How do they get there? That that's the the one thing that I I I, I want to see over this contract with JT Miller. Is I want to find out, I should say. How do they get there? How do they become a cup contender? Because they are putting a lot of you know contracts onto that pile that are going to be there for add a number of years now, right? And we all know how long the OEL one is. They have a couple more years of Dickinson and, and Pearson, which are not great contracts for them as well. You know, do they get there in the window that is JT Miller's contract? And when I say the window, you know, seven years, if you expect 90 plus points from JT Miller over the next seven years, well. Boy, I got some magic beans to sell you. Yeah, I like magic beans, but you charge me too much anyhow. So I'm not buying not buying my magic beans from you one. <laughs> um, look, I, I was always in the camp that thought 
he should be traded and would be traded. So I'm eating some crow here today. Yeah. Uh, but I always felt that a JT Miller trade was probably the best path to setting themselves up for that window of contention and really addressing the right side of their defense. But let's just play this through for a sec, because if the Rangers reported deal was the best deal that was on the table, Philip Heedle, Nils Lundqvist, and a first rounder. Like what if Heedle is already what he's going to be a 10 to 15 goal scorer who goes long stretches without being effective. And then let's say Lundqvist slides in and becomes a regular on the right side and plays and is part of what the Canucks have moving forward. But let's say the first rounder is a late first rounder because the Rangers take JT Miller and they have sure. success yep. and everybody's wary of giving away 2023 first rounder. So maybe the Rangers would have pushed it to a 2024 first round pick. I mean, that could take a couple of years to find uh, its way into the lineup. And then, you know, in three or four years, are the Canucks more competitive with JT Miller at the top of his game or with that package of players? So I, I think it's important to sort of try to consider that. Now, maybe there's some cost saving with the package that I mentioned compared to Miller at eight million bucks. So maybe you could go out and add, you know, yet another player. And I think that has to be taken into account as well. But, you know, if that's the best trade offer that they got, then I'm not sure the Canucks are a whole lot further ahead in two or three or four years. Yeah, with yeah it depends package. on what Lundqvist becomes. You know, it depends on what Lundqvist becomes. I think you're right about, you know, he's, he's, he is what he is. But if Lundqvist becomes, you know, top four stud right shot defenseman, and then you, as you added, you know, talking about be, have more money as well, Sure, but I, I, I think there, I'm picking I think up what you're putting good, down here, though. I think there's some real concerns about Lundqvist developing into a yeah. stud defense. Yeah, but exactly. I, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, he's right shot, but he, he profiles as an offensive guy. They've already got Quinn Hughes, who's not going anywhere. Sure. So, like, yeah. I don't know how many opportunities he would find himself. Again, I'm saying like, in my sort of the way I break it down there, like I'm I'm counting on him playing for the Canucks and being a part of what they've got. But you're right. That puts a lot of pressure on him to truly pan out. And then you're also hoping that that first rounder uh, is a guy that really steps in and is able to, to help this thing move in the right direction. And, and first rounders, late first rounders, you know, that's a crapshoot, right? Like there's just no guarantees. Jason Dickinson was a late first round pick. <laughs> I think a lot of the NHL is first round picks, right? It just depends on where you, where you oh, went. Sure. Really. I mean, that's where, you, but, that's where yeah. you find the elite talent is in the first yeah. round. And that's why, that's why people, you know, for the last decade have freaked out that the Canucks didn't do a proper rebuild, you know, didn't give themselves more lottery tickets, didn't, you know, trade away yeah. players and, and amass picks. Cause that's where you find elite talent is in the top couple of rounds of the draft. And so well, when you had to throw in a second rounder yeah. on top of the first rounder in the Arizona deal, like that had people yeah. pulling their hair out. Okay, so this is what, something I wanted to get to as well, as I look at sort of the prospect list, because as we sort of break down how do they get to become a cup, cup contender, well, I think the key is you know drafting well, right? And, and getting these guys that are going to be on ELCs to be able to come up and, and you know play in the NHL for you during those contracts, and they just don't have that right now. So it's going to be key for them to be able to you know draft well and or find those players that they can get on an ELC like, you know, Toronto did with like a Mike Bunting or something like that, right? Um, that's going to put a lot of pressure on 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 Rutherford and, and Alvin to be able to do that as well. I mean, they were basically handcuffed with this uh, cap the way it's it's structured for the Canucks anyway when they came into this job. So that was going to be an uphill climb for them regardless. But now they're really going to have to be able to you know sort of lean on these guys that are cheap. Kuzmenko could be someone that would be fantastic for them, but the problem with Kuzmenko is will he be a one and done? Right, like what happens if he has a, a great year and then is uh, you know becomes a five million dollar player? They're not going to be able to afford him after that. Well, somebody will have to go. I mean, the squeeze will be on. And Elvin mentioned that. Like he said, they can get a Horvat deal done now because Bode's deal this year, if they get an extension, it won't affect the cap. Right, like he's playing on the the, the final year of his current contract. But Elvin sure. recognized that any long term extension for Bo Horvat is going to have cap ramifications. And and to your point, if Kuzmenko hits then there simply isn't enough room and enough money to go around for Besser, for Garland, for Kuzmenko. Uh, somebody would have to go. Like they, they just would if you're going to keep Bo Horvat and sign him to a long-term contract as well. So, you know, you want Kuzmenko to have success. 
because I think it's better in the long run. It's better for him, but it's better for the team this year too if he has success rather than falls flat. But it's going to come at a cost, and and so in some ways, Andre Kuzmenko is really auditioning for every team in the NHL. You know, people watch him in the KHL, but we weren't sure what he is. I think all eyes are going to be on Kuzmenko. Uh, and how he fares in his first season, because uh, if he does have success, I think it's going to be difficult for the Canucks to keep him, or uh, it's going to force them to squeeze somewhere else. And and I think this management group knows it. And again, part of this is timing. Like We're not expecting the cap to go up significantly for a few more years. If it was going to go up next summer, that's a different conversation. But I Mm -hmm. think Canucks management recognizes that they're still looking at a relatively flat cap for uh, you know, this coming season, next summer as well. And then the hope is uh, that it goes up in two years' time. But, you know, that's for then. Right now, uh, the reality is that there just there isn't enough money. There isn't. Uh, not enough money in the system for the Vancouver Canucks. And, and again, they're going to have to find a way to shed some salary here before opening night. And, and that's one thing that, you know, both Rutherford and Elvine, when they took the job, I mean, they, they, their stated goal was to create this cap flexibility that we've talked about all summer. Instead, they get Kuzmenko now. It's an entry level deal this year, but they signed Besser, they signed Mikheyev, and now they've signed JT Miller. Like they've gone on this spending spree. Not to mention bring in Curtis Lazar as well. You know they haven't cut anywhere. Like they have not taken any strides whatsoever in their stated goal of creating cap flexibility. And at some point, at some point, uh, they're going to have to get to that. Yeah, and I'm wondering now too. Like, I'm wondering how quickly this all came together with the JT Miller contract. And, and, and I asked you about the pivot point because we had heard about Horvat and how, yep, they're going to get things done with Horvat. And it just seemed that the Miller you know, trade was going to be somewhere around the corner. And of course, it doesn't happen now. And as you sort of break down how much, you know, little how little money there is, you know, maybe they're kind of thinking back the Horvat extension now. Because what if Andre Kuzmenko becomes you know, a, a great player. What if he's a 60 point player next year for the Canucks? You know, do you maybe go, well, we got a sort of wealth of riches down the middle here. Maybe if we keep this, you, you see what I'm saying? Like what, you, is there a point maybe where they might go, maybe Horvat's not worth extending for us right now? Well, I, sure. But at the same time, how can Patrick Alvin, uh say with an honest face? And, I, and I, I'm not doubting the man at all. I sat there in his availability at eight rinks. Um, but how can he say we want to scale back JT Miller, but now you're going to talk about trading Bo Horvat as well? Like, well, I'm wondering if this has always been the plan. Like that, that's, you know what I mean? Like, has this always been the plan now? It's like, okay, screw it. We can't trade Miller. We're now we're going to go Miller and we're going to go Horvat. Like, or well, but, is there been by signing JT Miller, they're all in. Their chips have been pushed to the middle here. They have made this conscious decision, whether they're ready to or not as an organization, they're in their contention window. Like it or not, this is what like you get. Plug your nose, so, you're going in kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cannonball. <laughs> like, uh, uh, and so I thought it was fascinating to hear Patrick Alvin okay. today say, there, you, you don't go from missing the playoffs to being a cup contender, that there are some steps there. And yet by signing JT Miller long-term, you know, it, it throws any notion of even a modified rebuild out the window uh, this is the group that they're moving forward with. And, and uh, you know, I, I feel like we pick on Jason Dickinson an awful lot here. I mean, he brought a lot of it on with his play last year. But, you know, if he was waiting in the wings and could give you even a smidge of what Bo Horvat gives you in sort of that third line capacity, that would create some flexibility for the organization. But Jason Dickinson's not Bo Horvat. He's not even in, in the, you know, I mean, Horvat scored 31 goals and got hurt at the end of the year. And Dickinson's never had double digits. So, you know, again, if they had guys that were in the minors that were down in Abbotsford that were knocking on the door that were over seasoned down there, but those guys don't exist either. And so yeah. that's kind of this whole, you know, I get where people are coming from that are saying like, this is just going to keep them trapped in the middle here for a whole lot longer by committing this much money and this much term to JT Miller. But management again, felt that, you know, the bird in the hand kind of thing with this player, um, but man, you just wish that they had like some great A prospects, that they had a couple of guys that were further along in their development curve that were knocking on the door. And, you know, for those that are screaming like a Will Lockwood type of play, like, again, Will Lockwood, like I'll give him every opportunity. But first of all, he's not a center, but also, 
you know, 15 games without a point. Like, does that get to 20 games, 25? At what point do you say, hey, just not ready for prime time? So I, I don't look at Will Lockwood as a guy, even though he's had a taste, that's, you know, banging down the door no. to be a full-time yeah. NHLer. Um, you know, they've got How would, how would an extra $5.9 million sound for you? Because that's what Pearson and Dickinson make up. Right. right. And and that would be some cap flexibility. Yeah. And and again, there are going to be good players that are on waivers that are on, you know, that teams either can't afford or uh, are going to try to stash in the minors, whatever the case. Like this year's like that day where you have to set your roster the day before the opening night. Like there are going to be some good players that are available. And if you had that cap flexibility, but the Canucks right now are part of the, you know, the halves that have too much on the books. And they're one of the teams that's going to have to try to, to move some players at, at some point here. So, you know, I don't anticipate that we'll see a lot of movement before training camp, but through the preseason and right up to that roster deadline, I, I think it's really going to be fascinating to watch this time around. I'm just staring at next year's um, on cap friendly, just looking at the numbers right now. And, you know, it's Horvat and Kuzmenko. They're just staring at each other to me. Because if Kuzmenko ends up being a player, he's gone. And if you choose Horvat over Kuzmenko, are you maybe going, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to get Bo Horvat out of town. I'm just looking at it now as, as you say, you push those chips in with JT Miller. And from everything we've heard of, and, and actually let's hear from Patrick Guffin because he talked about Bo Horvat, but from everything we had heard, you know, that they were going to negotiate a new contract with him. So here's what Alvin had to say today in terms of Bo's, you know, contract and negotiation, whether it will impact uh, further cap decisions. Uh, we don't have to make moves uh, coming into this season in order to uh, to um, get Bo signed here, but uh uh, moving forward, uh, we need to um, uh, be aware of the cap situation and uh, potentially um, uh, some roster decisions uh, coming into next summer. Yeah, I heard something. I don't think it was on Donnie and Dolly today. Those guys are back as well. Um, talking about perhaps maybe a Garland being the guy that you ship out. Yep. I think a lot of that yep. weighs on what Kuzmenko is, though, right? Like, you just can't ship out Garland because you need that money. Like, you need him as a player as well. Totally. So, that's what I said. You, it's in everybody's best interest for this season that Kuzmenko is a, a an NHL player and a, a successful one. If he's a 20 to 25 goal scorer, though, then maybe the redundancy is a, a player like Connor Garland. Um and so it puts pressure on Rock Besser too, because if Besser has a disappointing sure. season, like yeah. I don't know. Like Patrick Alvine was asked about his core group. You probably heard, you know, and he, he rattled off names and he didn't include Besser. And that had some people freaking out in the market. I mean, first of all, like how many names can you name? Like in a right, like you can't yeah. name the entire roster and call it your core. And I think he named the names that most people would. And and yeah, you know, I didn't take it as a shot or any kind of slight at Brock Besser. This team committed to Brock Besser, gave him a three-year deal. He's got some security, but that doesn't mean that he figures in their long-term plans if he doesn't get to, and we said it on the last podcast, like it's mm-hmm. time. It's time for him to be a 30-goal scorer. Um, you know, the team's committed to him. He's being paid now like a goal scorer, a legit goal scorer. Uh, it's go time for Brock Besser, and if it doesn't happen, then – you know, maybe it is time to move him on and, and, but, I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but yeah, this totally. just comes back to, but it comes back to this notion that look, change is a constant in pro sport and they're just in a flat cap world. There won't be enough to go around and somebody's getting squeezed. So uh, Alvin's not wrong. Uh, Horvat deal this year. They, they've got cost certainty with Bo Horvat for the remainder of this season, but if they lock him into a long-term deal, it is going to have implications next year and beyond. What's Bo Horvat's next deal look like? Uh, you know, for the longest time, I kind of thought it would be a max deal because I, I, I thought as a legacy player and a captain that, you know, his camp would want that eighth year. I mean, the Canucks were able to get seven, not eight for JT Miller. So that was a win uh, for the organization on on that front. But uh, you know, I, I would think that the Horvat camp would probably push for the max deal. And then like, I've, I've never felt that it's going to be a huge raise money wise. Like, you know, he's at five and a half. Does he get 
to six and a half. I've seen some people suggest that he could get to seven. I mean, seven by eight, all of a sudden now you're 56 million bucks, just like you are with JT Miller. I, I'm not so sure about that on Bo Horvat. I just think, you know, if he gets an eight-year deal at six to six and a half, it's a bit of a push on what he's making right now, but, you know, it sets him up for a lifetime. I mean, the, you're looking at a compensation package somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 million. I think for me, that's the number for Horvat. Like, can he get to $50 million? Um, Does the team want to go there? And then, like, it's funny because when he signed his contract in Edmonton, I, I kind of thought that the Nuge was laying a template for – you know, again, he was a first round pick. He was a first overall pick, obviously. Wears a letter, uh, has had some good offensive seasons, is used in lots of situations by the Oilers, veteran guy. You know, he chose Edmonton. He could have played out his contract and gone to unrestricted free agency. I, I, I'm still like, I'm at a total loss how the Oilers got Ryan Nugent Hopkins to commit to eight years at $5.1 million. Like, I'm wondering if he's kicking himself now when he sees what's happening on the open market. So, that's you know, the McDavid some, factor right there. It's got to be. Like, you, guess, you get to play with I, McDavid, I, but he's going to get paid. Thought, like, I, and I kind of thought, like, man, that's a template that, you know, his deal came in just a shade over $40 million. And I thought, uh, maybe a Hor- Horvat, you know, $45 million, But now I'm thinking closer to, to $50 uh, for Bo Horvat if it is, in fact, the eight-year deal. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the Canucks may have some reservation about going eight, but they're the only team that can give him that eighth deal or that eighth year Right now, obviously. So I would think if you're the Horvat camp that you would try to leverage that as as much as you can. But, uh, you know, that's where it starts to get a little bit dicey, right? If you're uh, if you're looking at 50 over eight years, at 6.25. So, again, it's not a quantum leap in the annual average value for a guy like Bo Horvat, but it is a raise. It reflects a raise. And you're looking at a raise that would take him – to what? I mean, he's 27 now. He'll be 28 in April. So you're looking at a deal that'll take him to age 36. Uh, all the same concerns that you had about JT Miller and the back end of his contract, yeah. you know, those would all exist with Bo Horvat as well. Can you afford to spend, what would that be, like $21 million down the middle? Actually, more than that. Well, and especially because the, you know, the following year, Pedersen's up for yeah. another extension. <laughs> true, so too. It's yeah. just, uh, the, the meter's running here, and Pod yeah. Colson's going to come out of his entry. And, they, you know, and that's the thing. It's like Tyler Myers is the only big number that's coming off the books. OEL is under contract till like the year 2100 or something. It, it, <laughs> uh, yeah. it just it feels, it feels like, like a like contract. That. Yeah, that's never going to go away. But really, Tyler Myers, you know, it, uh, of the non core. So Alvin recognizes this core group and. Really, outside of that, the only contract that's up soon is Tyler Myers, and it's two years away. So, um, you know, that's where you wish there was just a year left on his deal or Dickinson or Pearson, but there's two years left on all of those guys. And we've just seen repeatedly how difficult it is. And even Alvin talked today about the price that teams are paying to get out from under contracts. And you know, he didn't sound like a guy that uh, had a huge appetite to do it. But the reality is, like, you know, would you be willing to part with a second rounder right now to make Tanner Pearson's contract or Jason Dickinson's contract go away? And, and I don't know that a second rounder would do it, quite frankly. But I wonder, this management group has said, we don't want to part with draft picks. We don't want to, you know, throw in sweeteners to get out from under these contracts. But ultimately, that may be the only way to make a couple of those contracts disappear before they expire. And then we just went over the, how important it is to have young players that are coming up through the system yeah. and, eat and playing well, on ELTs. It goes, it's and- a vicious circle, man. It is a vicious circle. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Jim. <laughs> um, one of the things I, I, I've been thinking about too is, you know, you brought up the fact that uh, Rutherford basically walked a tightrope when it came to uh, the cap because he, you know, the superstars that he had in Pittsburgh. So it's not really all that unfamiliar for him. But I also look at Rutherford's age and wonder, you know, if he's like, I'm going to be here to, you know, <laughs> the end no, of the No, absolutely. Like, like no. I, I, no disrespect to Jim Rutherford at all. No, but, and, but and he honestly, wasn't, and, he and, wasn't and brought I, in here to, to go yeah. through a full rebuild and tear yeah. it down and build it back up but, again. But also, J-Pat, like, think about it. If, if Kuzmenko hits, right? Yep. Like, this could be one of those teams like, that you're like, holy shit. Like, remember when Kuzmenko was on the Canucks that one year? And you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, like they, yeah. that forward group... It, when you break it down, you put the lines together, you know, 
it's a good forward group. It's very good. Sure it is. Group. Yeah. No, and I, the defense we've seen the defense held up last year to, you know, when Bruce got there and they, you know, they, 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 they almost made the playoffs, but yeah, this could be one of those years where you're like, Holy shit. Like they were stacked that year. And then, you know, cause Manco could go and, you know, hit a home run somewhere else. But you know, maybe that's what they're thinking right now as well. You know, it's just like, well, screw it. We got these guys. We saw that they can play, you know, they were essentially a playoff team under Bruce Woodrow. Like, why not just go for it here? I, I wonder if they're, if that's a school of thought for them. I do think that they truly believe, top to bottom, that the team under Bruce Boudreau is the team. And that those first 25 games, they know that penalty kill sunk them and that, you know, there were some factors for that as well. But, like, these guys think that they've turned a page, that they probably feel they turned a page last December 4th or 5th. But I think in hindsight now, like, the past is the past. And... They believe that this coach is the right guy for this group and that he brought this positivity and he reached these players and that he was able to pump them up and build the ones up that needed it. And then they've gone out and they've added uh, Mikheyev and they've added Kuzmenko and they've added Curtis Lazar. And so, you know, this Mm -hmm. team that played at an absolute playoff pace uh, got a little bit better. I mean, reinforced. But, you know, it does come back. It's a long season. And it's not even like when you look at their defense score, to me, it's not – all right, so you've got Quinn Hughes and maybe you've got Luke Shen and then you've got OEL and Myers and now you've got Dermott and is Rathbone ready to play? It's not that. It's what happens when OEL gets injured? What happens yeah. if Tyler Myers is out for any length yeah. of time? Like the, no doubt. the six yeah. guys that they trot, trot out to start the season, you know, I'm not screaming and yelling and doing cartwheels about their top six. It's the depth. It's what happens when guys lower are forced to step up and play higher in the lineup. And and we just don't know. Like if Travis Dermott can play and, and can step in and give them minutes in the top four, you know, when he's called upon, then like that's a huge asset to this hockey club. If Travis Dermott, you know, if they choose to play him on the right side and he's able to step in and and, and do so capably like that provides some flexibility for this group as well. So, you know, I know we've talked in other episodes too, and we're getting close to training camp where finally we'll see what Bruce Boudreaux has concocted over the summer. But, you know, if he's looking at uh, a veteran player, if it's uh, an OEL that's moving over to the right side, Mm -hmm. whatever, uh, you know, there are some questions that are going to have to be answered. But to me, it's not so much about the top end of their lineup. It's depth when you get the inevitable injuries. And I just don't think even with some of the additions that they have made here and Brady Keeper healthy, um, you know, those types of guys. Like, Brady Keeper's played two games in the NHL. And I'm not ready to declare that Brady Keeper is the missing ingredient that, you know, oh, they didn't have him last year. That's one of the reasons they fell short. Um, It's just that injuries happen. It's a big boy game and a contact sport. And how do you get around that And heaven forbid anything happens to Quinn Hughes because yeah. that, that changes the conversation. We're Shush. not going down that road. No, I know. I know. Don't but, put that out in the universe. <laughs> no, but you know, depth is, uh, it's an issue. It is. And so let's yeah. see how they're able to, to plug some of the holes uh, when those uh, injuries inevitably arise. Yeah. You talk about uh, guys that might shake out of rosters here though. But the one thing is, is that, and I've heard some names sort of, uh, out there, Calvin DeHaan is one of them. Like, how do the Canucks even go about that, though? Like, just looking at their cap, it's, I mean, I'm not a capologist, but, I mean, ca- can can they even get anybody in here? Uh, I don't know. Maybe Dickinson well, I mean, they the, can, to the AHL. Yeah, I, don't I mean, they can, I mean, some of the guys that, you know, we talk about Dickinson, um, you know, a player like that could get buried in the minors. Now, you can't yeah. bury his entire contract, but you can get some Tom, savings. Yeah. yeah. And so... Uh, you know, let's see about Tucker Pullman. And, you know, you look at a thing like Cap Friendly and they've got Justin Dowling on the big league roster right now. Yeah. I don't think that's happening. Uh, you know, so you bury his contract. Uh, you know, I, I think there are some cap gymnastics that can be done that certainly can get them cap compliant for opening night. But again, it's not, you want to walk that fine line. You want to maximize Furland and his LTIR benefits and all those types of things. Um but nothing's ever done in a vacuum. It's not just about this year, as Alvin talked about. It's, you know, recognizing that every move they make now is going to impact them now, but for the future as well. So, um, you know, this is where this front office was brought in, all these diverse uh, viewpoints and opinions and backgrounds and everything else. You know, you're hoping that this background is a mix of new and old with Rutherford, but others getting a first opportunity. 
you know, that they can get some creativity and come up with some answers to take what they did last year for those 57 games under Bruce Boudreaux. You know, again, they hope that they've, uh, the hope is they've made this roster better, uh, address some of the areas of concern, the penalty kill and those types of things. And we'll see if, uh, you know, this group is as advertised, but you know, you're not wrong. Like you look around the NHL, like I, I think this forward group, and it's making some assumptions. It's making an assumption that Elias Patterson is from day one going to be the star Elias Patterson and not the guy that struggled. And that JT Miller is going to pick up somewhere close to where he left off. And that, you know, Horvat's completely healthy after finishing the year injured and all those types of things. Um, but if they get the production, and I, I look, I, I get that that sentence started with an if. Uh, if they get the production, though, from the players that they're hoping, and we talked about, uh, you know, now some of the pressure's on the wings because Besser has to step up and they need a little bit more from Garland. And, you know, Mikhail is being paid to produce. And so he has to hold his end of the bargain as well. You know, if they get those types of things, then yeah. Like, I think with the power play that they're able to try it out as well, this team should be, uh, I, I would think, would be, you know, goal scoring should not be any kind of issue whatsoever for the Vancouver Canucks this season. Okay, you referenced that Patrick Alvin uh, mentioned that the Canucks are not a cup contender. Here is the Canucks GM uh, on what he said today. There is a lot of work. Uh, I don't think you just... Uh go from being a non-playoff team to be a Stanley Cup winner. I think this is a process over time that uh, I think in today's game, you want to be, our goal is to be a, a very competitive competitive team over time. And, and by being that, we need to make a big step this year. And, and, uh, and I believe that the players are uh, prepared and their mindset is that uh, they're ready to come in here for day one and training. Okay, so a couple things I want to break down there, but uh, one thing is the big step. What is the big step then for them this year? Is that just just making the playoffs? Yeah, I, I think it is. It's time. Um, you know, Miller referenced that he hasn't played a playoff game at Rogers Arena. He's played one at Rogers Place in Edmonton in the bubble. Uh, and really, for any guy that's been around you know, for the last five years, uh, maybe outside of Horvat. Like, I'm not sure that anybody's played a, a home playoff game at, at Rogers Arena. So it just feels like it's time. Um, and that would represent a step. And it would mean that, you know, there wasn't a 25-game stretch in their season that sunk them, that, you know, they had some consistency. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I that's reading between the lines. Like, Alvin didn't come right out and say it, but I would think that, getting playoff experience, more playoff experience. Because guys like Hughes and Pedersen, their first taste of the NHL playoffs was in the bubble, and they performed. Like, they stepped up. They were both really good, and that's what excites you about just, you know, get them back into the playoffs to see, you know, what they're capable of doing um, with this group. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's how I would answer that question that, you know, a bare minimum is making the playoffs beyond that. I think he's looking at, you know, a guy like Quinn Hughes to continue to elevate his game and, and grow into the player that, uh, you know, he's he's shown flashes of the player that they think he can be, but I still think there's room to grow there. Last season was a really good year for him. Uh, some consistency from Patterson, Besser being more of a productive goal scorer. So individually, there are guys that need to take a step, and if they do, I think collectively uh, this team as a whole should be able to, to take a step as well. And he just talked about how you have to sort of build to get there. But what does that window look like now? And that is the, one of the reasons why, you know, I look at this Miller contract and, and I go, yeah, like I like it because I like the player. And I think the player right now is, you know, in, in, in you know, best, best he's ever played in the NHL. But you've got two years left of Elias Pettersson. You've got three years left of Brock Besser. Then he's outright UFA at that point. Pettersson's under control still after a couple more years. You got Pod Colson coming up here as well. That's two more years of, you know, JT Miller getting older, two more years of OEL getting older. Like, where is, when is this team going to be able to get to that point that he talks about? And are they going to be able to do it in the competitive window that is, say, JT Miller's contract is Oliver Ekman Larson, who seems to be, you know, on the other side of his contract as well. Like, it, I just don't know when that happens for this core group. And it feels like they're, they're going to have to be some major changes. But the problem is, is you're stuck with OEL. <laughs> and you might be stuck with JT Miller if, if his game falls off you know, in two, three, four years, right? Right. So, I mean, it kind of comes back to the things we've talked about that, you know, their hands are tied and they have elected here, you know, rather than suss out other solutions, they double down with Miller pushed to the middle and this is their group. And then the, the GM comes out and says, well, we're not a Stanley Cup contender yet. We've got lots of work to do. 
I, we just addressed that, you know, they need to take a step forward here, but there's no guarantee they will. And then I guess the question is, what if, like, what if, you know, what if they aren't the team that they think they are? What if some of that was just new coach magic and that they sort of find a level that isn't, you know, I, I don't even want to go down that road because I, I want to see them take a stride so that, you know, this fan base gets home playoff dates and there's a, a buzz and excitement in the city. But, you know, that's why there is this disconnect of how do you get from here to there when all you're doing is spending money, but you're not addressing some of the areas that need to be addressed. So, um, you know, you mentioned a guy like Calvin DeHaan. Um, I know Dolly Wall's reported that uh, they continue to have dialogue there. He seems to think that uh, DeHaan's going to make a decision. Uh, in the, and, and, you know, training camp, either here or anywhere is just around the corner. So I can understand why a guy is getting a little antsy if he doesn't have a contract. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, somebody asked Patrick Galvin, like, all right, is this the group you're going to go to training camp with? And, you know, he shrugged his shoulders and said, you never know. So I, I, he knows more than we do because he's obviously leading those internal discussions. Mm-hmm. But the reality is they don't have a ton of money to play with. In fact, they have to shed. They, you know, so unless there is a, a trade coming here ahead of the season, but they've had all off season to sort of make some of those salary shedding trades and, and they haven't been able to do them. So I have to assume that that just tells you uh, how difficult it is for teams that are in the Canucks boat to, you know, to get out from under money without uh, making it easy, like adding an incentive. And they just don't want to do that one. So, you know, I, look, I don't have an answer to your question. How do they get from here to the Stanley cup contender? Certainly doesn't feel like it's going to be any kind of straight line. Like I think that there are yeah. going to be some bumps in the road there, but you know, they're loading up. They think that they've got a forward group that's uh, highly competitive and they know that they've got an all-star level goaltender. And so, so much of it comes back to, you know, what can they squeeze out of this defense core and what does it look like when they line them up? Who's playing where and, you know, and how does that work? And and if you move OEL to the right side, does that open you up? You know, on the left side, like there are some questions now. Is Rathbone ready? All that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's what we love in this market. Like these are all great talking points and these are all going to be fascinating things to watch as this season unfolds. I, I believe I might have asked you this before, but is there something there still with Oliver Ekman Larson? Yeah, I mean, the guy can play. You know, it's just that the contract is such a millstone. And the take, away the, take away the contract right now. Is it, could, Can he get to maybe just like, I don't want to say all-star level, but can he get no, to I, close I to OEL so. level? There's so many good young defensemen in the NHL. I I don't see him getting back to all-star level. I think he was better in the second half than the first. I think he was a guy that responded to the coaching change a little bit. I think Bruce freed him up, um, you know, under Travis Green. And remember at the start of the season, he and Myers, you know, essentially like they were told to forget about the offensive side of the ice, like just focus on, on defense and being the shutdown pair. And they were pretty good off the hop, but it's a long season. And I think OEL, you know, he, he reverted a little bit more. And maybe it just comes with the territory of settling into a new city and a new system and two coaches and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, he was able to pick up the bulk of his points in the second half of the season compared to the first. But, you know, I, I think at this stage, we're not judging OEL on his point total. Like, you know, if he has 20 points, if he has 30 points, I think it's more about what's left in his tank, how well-rounded is his game, can he still play the matchup game. Now, if you're going to ask him to play the right side, and, that, and I don't know that they are, but if if you're moving him to the right side at this stage of his career, what challenges does that throw at him? Uh, what does that do in terms of his uh, effectiveness? You know, is it possible that he could pair with Quinn Hughes? Um, you know, I, I think I, we that, can judge him by his point total a little bit, though. And the reason why I say that is because he's going to quarterback that second power play unit. Now, I know that first power play unit didn't allow the second unit really a lot of ice right. time. And that's a good yeah. thing for the Canucks. But he had 29 points last year, and a third of them were on the power play. You know, if he can get himself to, let's say, 39 points, and a third of them are on the power play, like that, I, I, I think that's, I think that's what you want. I mean, if you could get. If you could get ten goals from him from the from from the blue line, that'd be huge. Now he'd have to double that because he had five last year. But you know he's had as high as twenty three, and I know he was a much younger man back then. But if you could get ten, because we we've talked about this on the in in past episodes, like 
Quinn Hughes doesn't score a lot from the point no. as well, right? So Myers yeah, I think had one I, goal last year. Yeah, like, I, exactly. I, yeah. You know, and then they've gone out and they've bolstered their forward. You like I I don't see a whole lot of goal scoring offense from the back end. I just don't. Um and now you've added other guys up front that are going to be expected. There's only one puck out there. So um you know, like could you get a little more offense out of OAL? Sure, you hope so. I still think that that first unit is going to be like flat out fire. And and I don't know as much as we talk about, oh, it's great to have two units and all that kind of stuff. I, I still think in a perfect world, your first unit you trot your first unit out, they score, and nobody cares whether the second <laughs> yeah, unit yeah. gets a, a sniff. So um, you know, I kind of see it going down that way because I, I just think bringing back all the same guys on that first unit, they're you know, Quinn Hughes is a year older, Pedersen hopefully uh, plays the whole season. You know, Miller's back. Horvat kind of quietly has become a, a real power play scoring ace. Um, there's just no reason to think that that power play isn't going to carry them on a lot of nights this coming season, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Like, and JT Miller even admitted. Uh, I asked him. Uh, on his Zoom, like how good can that power play get? And and he agreed that, you know, same guys coming back, you know, just getting into sync, reading off each other. And as he said, trying to be a step ahead of the defenders, well, the more they play together, the more they're going to just fall into that naturally. And so uh, I think this is really going to be, I'm not saying that the power play is make it or break it for the playoffs. I just think if they get to the playoffs, we're going to look back and we're going to say, you know, that power play was really good all season long. And it wasn't so much the second unit that chipped in with a handful of goals. It was that the top unit put the hammer down night after night after night after night. Okay, let's uh, put a bow on the Alvin and, and, and Miller discussions from today. And let's talk about our Bowdog line. They got props out already, J-Pat, for the Canucks season right now. So mm-hmm. we asked you, the Can- Bowdogs has the Canucks at minus 130 to make the playoffs this year, would you make that bet or take the plus 100 to miss the playoffs? So basically even money to miss the playoffs or minus 130 to make the playoffs right now. I'm going to make a selection. I just selected minus 130. It's 83% are saying minus 130 to make the playoffs. Where would you put your money? You know, all summer I've kind of thought that this group will be right there in the mix as they were this past season but I wasn't sure that they have done enough here, especially on the back end, to be a playoff team. But but the more that I look at the Canucks, the more I look at what's going on around them, and I, I, I will get into season previews uh, closer to the start of the, the regular season. But, you know, I think Calgary and Edmonton certainly look like teams to beat in the Pacific. And I, I, I like the Los Angeles Kings, the strides they took last year, and then adding Kevin Fiala. So, you know, I think it's going to be a challenge for the Canucks to be a divisional playoff team. But there's no reason that they shouldn't be a wild card. Like, I, I think the level of talent that they've assembled, the additions that they have made, if Thatcher Demko is healthy and holds up his end of the bargain, uh, you know, I'm starting to think that this should be a playoff team. And maybe that's wishful thinking that I want playoff hockey for the market and all that kind of stuff. But no, let's raise the bar a little bit. It, you know, it, it just it feels like it's time to raise the bar on this team and have some expectations. So uh, I do anticipate that. You know, I'll I'll save great proclamations and predictions for closer to time. But as I sit here right now, first episode of season two, yeah, I, I think the Canucks should be a playoff team. Yeah, and judging by you know what happens with the roster, we don't even know what's going to happen with rosters. You might get uh, lesser value as well. So maybe lay that money down right now over at Bodog, the place to play free casino games and get the latest sports. Odds. We also have been doing the greatest Canuck to wear, and we're getting deep now, J Pat. We're almost there, buddy. I know. I saw we were at the Cole Lind in 78. So we're getting there. You go. Yeah. So 78. And uh, we asked you, name the only player in franchise history to wear it. And you said it right there. It was Cole Lynn. Uh, He wore 78. I found this one to be interesting just in terms of the way that the voting went. But greatest Canuck to wear the number 77. And we broke it down between Anson Carter, Nikolai Goldobin. And Brad Hunt, um, <laughs> <laughs> who, who do you think the people voted for there? Oh, geez. Um, yeah, I mean, one season of Anson Carter, one season of Brad Hunt, and parts Basically, of a couple of seasons yeah. through old Goldie. Uh, I'm going to say Goldie got the sentimental vote. He did not. An overwhelming 70% of voters went with Anson Carter that big year that Anson Carter had playing alongside the Sedins. What did he have? He had the Sedins numbers, 33 and 22 in terms of 
goals and assists that year, and then he jumped ship after that uh, out of town. But um, yeah, Anson Carter winning that vote. Goldie only got 17% of the vote. Oh, poor Goldie. Yeah, <laughs> Brad Hunt, oh, well. 12%. I believe it was the Price family that all went and uh, voted for Nikolai Goldov and our buddy Blake Price. Big fan of Well, I can't wait for 77. 79. Mike, 79 will be Michael Furland and Mike Duco, I think, are the oh, only guys that ever wore 79. Oh, wow. Uh, last report, Mike Duco was part of the NHL's program to get former players to become officials, but I don't know how far he went with that but that was the last i ever saw of mike duco who was here very very briefly if you have a mike duco jersey please uh <laughs> send us a photo of it at rink wide podcast on twitter at instagram or hit us up in the great clips inbox 778-402-9680 by the way that inbox is an exclusive text message club so just send a text in saying hey what's up rink wide guys how you doing want to be a part of the club because we give away exclusive prizes uh, to our members of the text message inbox club. Thanks to great clips. It's going to be great as it always is at great clips for sponsoring that. Uh, we also ha- are going to have nine o'clock gun hats to give away this year. J Pat, nice. all 82 like post it. games, our friends at nine o'clock gun going to be giving away hats as well. Also want to announce this today because we sort of teased it a little bit, but we're going to be doing some pregame pods now, a little mm-hmm. digestible mid afternoon. You know, we'll let we'll send you down to the rink. If it's a home game, Get you to gather it all up, come back, give us a little bite-sized pregame for the folks before the puck drops. Yeah, all the nuggets of info that we gather from the rink, we'll compile it and we'll put it out there. As you said, highly digestible, uh, you know, 15 minutes in out sort of thing, but it'll be a, a pregame pod. And of course, uh, the postgame pod is still our bread and butter and looking forward to getting those going with the preseason and then into the regular season. So uh, postgame, nothing changes. Non-game days, nothing changes, but uh, we're just adding digestible pregame pods, just uh, one-stop shopping. So, uh, you know, again, you won't miss anything in terms of the lineups and who's in, injury notes, uh, you know, anything we pick up from the morning skate, we'll throw it all in there, maybe a clip or two from uh, yeah. uh, coaches and players. And, uh, yeah, so we'll deliver a, a pregame pod as long as you are, you know, hit that follow button. You don't want to miss anything. So if you haven't done it in year one, uh, here's your, your chance to start year two with us. Hit the follow button and it will be delivered directly to your device and you will not miss a single thing. Yeah, I mentioned the uh, Twitter and Instagram accounts. We're also going to have a TikTok account as well that we're going to get going. So look out for that. And we do have a YouTube page that's up right now. It's a little bare bones at the moment. but We'll be putting up uh, some exclusive content on there throughout the year. So follow us on all our socials. And yeah, we got you covered pre, uh, post, daily. We got your uh, Canucks fix, if you will, between myself and myself. And J-Pat. So, yeah, season two kicking off, J-Pat. And once again, want to thank our friends at Bodog for taking on uh, the title sponsorship. Looking forward to another season of Canucks coverage for Jeff Patterson. Hey, hey, um, no, 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 oh, no, 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 oh, no. We're not oh, quite done yet. I know okay. you thought we were done. We're not done. Oh, what uh, we got? Well, a couple things. Uh, I just wanted to mention as well, our buddies, uh, Sakaris and Price, they've got uh, their football pick and pool. I know this is a hockey pod, but uh, hey, That's we're right. all in this together. And this is a great chance, if you haven't, the NFL season's kicking off here uh, this week. So get in. Don't waste any time. Uh, you test your football knowledge every week. You pick winners against the spread. You see how you stack up against Go Goat Sports uh, members, myself and Wadnerian, T Mart, uh, Kurt, Matt, Blake, you name it. Uh, so you have a chance to to go against us uh, all season long. Details on prizes uh, are coming soon, but there's going to be weekly and season long grand prizes that uh, you want to hear about. So check it out. Uh, you can just check out their social accounts, uh, Sakaris and Price on Twitter. Uh, for entry details and pricing rules. Also, just wanted to mention, and this will pick up, I think, as we go here. I was out at eight rings today to hear from Patrick Alvine, but uh, Nils Hoaglander, Tyler Myers, Luke Shen, uh, the latest names to join the group that's uh, skating out in Burnaby. Uh, I'm told that the, the skates will probably continue out at Burnaby. That You know, the renovations that the Canucks had talked about, uh, they're upgrading the dressing room and stuff. Like any construction progress, project, it looks like it might go down to the wire. Uh, for those preseason games that uh, there's still some work to be done that uh, Rogers Arena, a bit of a construction zone behind the scenes. So uh, guys are skating out at eight rinks. And I have to tell this story quickly. I was in the grocery store on the weekend and there I was pushing my cart and I'm, you know, in the cookie aisle or wherever I am. Attaboy. And, and a guy, I never miss the cookie aisle, trust me. Mm-hmm. Uh, a guy coming the other way, pushing his cart. And as he got right up beside me, I think, hey, he recognized it was me. And uh, my wife and I were just in our little 
grocery mode, so I wasn't thinking much of it. And this guy all of a sudden says, uh, hey, love the podcast. And so I turned around like to say, hey, thanks, man. And he was still turned around looking at me. And as I am turning to say thank you to him, he's not watching where he's going. He crashes into like one of those pop-up displays that's in the aisle, like mid-aisle. And I think he felt pretty sheepish about it, but he, he was laughing. I had a good laugh. And anyways, uh, thanks. I wish I got the guy's name, uh, rink-wide supporter, and we appreciate everybody that uh, is there for us as uh, a listener. So uh, just got a, a good chuckle out of uh, the grocery guy that uh, crashed his cart uh, to let me know that he likes the podcast. J-Pat, the celebrity, always getting <laughs> in public, just people always coming up to you. Yeah, just a regular day for the old Patterson I, I guess I, I guess I'm glad I didn't pass him out in the parking lot when we were yeah. in the cars. <laughs> That's uh, probably the, the best news of all. Probably, probably best. By the way, with the uh, Rogers Arena construction, are we going to have to wear hard helmets uh, for pre-games, preseason games? Uh, I, I haven't heard that yet. I, they've got one home game out in Abbotsford. Uh, I think the others are supposed to go. I mean, the, the building and the bowl and ice and everything is fine. It's just it's behind the scenes. So I'll be curious to see. You know, Wasn't they it may the press have press area as well that they're redoing. Oh, uh, they saying, were doing right? some work. Yeah. yeah, the under the stands, the media workroom, and, and yeah. those types of things, and the medical. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of curious. They may have to patch some of that together. Then remember, they start on the road for five games. That'll buy them a, yeah. a little bit more time, but. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see. But for now, guys are skating out at eight rinks, and uh, I would imagine that uh, more and more will join as uh, the days march on here closer to training camp. Yeah, get into that pick'em pool as well if, uh, if you're an NFL fan. Uh, those are always fun. I, I like pick'em pools, and also, um, how do they know? Like, who who? What's your like? Do you have a fancy name? Because I I got a made up name myself. What's yours? Mine's J Pat's picks. It's pretty simple. Okay. Yeah, took you a while to come up with that one, eh? Yep. Okay. Well, I'm Megatron Sanders. All right. Of course. Megatron Sanders. Put it together. Big oh, Lions I fan. I got it right off the top. Yes. <laughs> I don't like admitting I'm a big Lions fan, but I'm a big Lions fan. I like eating kneecaps and such. Okay. Can I wrap it up now? Yeah. All right. Done. For Jeff Patterson, I'm Andrew Wadden. This has been another edition of the Rink Wide Podcast. And remember, Rink Wide is the show. Come on. Let's go.